Hello, and welcome to the Juniper Network's Learning Bytes series. I'm Josh McKenzie, a content developer here at Juniper Education Services. And today, we're going to be talking about how we can use Docker Compose to build multi-tier application test environments. So once we're done here today, we should be able to describe the use cases for Docker Compose and understand how to define and build a Docker Compose stack. So what is Docker Compose? Docker Compose is a tool that allows us to create, define, and deploy multi-container Docker applications. It simplifies the process of starting, stopping, and rebuilding services. And specifically here, we are talking about applications that rely on multiple interconnected services. In other words, microservices style architectures. Uh, simplifies viewing the status of those running services, streaming the log output of running services, and running commands against multiple containers that make up a service. Specifically, Docker Compose has a few use cases. Uh, this is not something that is designed to scale uh, to production levels. What we're really talking about here with Docker Compose are development environments, uh, automated testing environments, and single host deployments, uh, which all have in common the lack of scale. So if we're looking at taking a microservices application and deploying it at scale, Docker Compose is not really the appropriate tool for that. That's where something like Docker Swarm or Kubernetes is going to come into play. So Docker Compose, very useful for testing. To illustrate the use of Docker Compose, we're going to build a very simple two-tier application as shown in this slide. So we're going to create a simple web app that just shows us a list of books, which are drawn from a books database. So to do this, we're going to use the standard Mongo database image from the Docker Hub. We're going to populate that with a sample set of book data. Inside of our web application, which is written using the Python Flask library, uh, when a user makes a request to that web application, it's going to go pull the information from that book's database and format it for display in a web page. All of this together, our database service, our web application service, as well as the networks involved here. So we have a backend network, which connects the database to the web app, and a front-end network, which is going to be exposed for uh, web application users. All of those components are going to be defined in one file, which defines our Docker Compose stack. And when we're working with Docker Compose, we're not working directly at the level of any individual component we're gonna be dealing with the stack as a whole. And that's where the real simplification comes in. So you can imagine, you know, with two tiers, managing this directly with Docker, probably not too difficult. But as your application becomes more complex and we have say 10 or 12 different microservices involved here, you can see how having one tool to spin up and tear down all of those services as one unit can be really useful for testing. So let's take a look quickly at our actual application components. So on the left here, you can see the structure, the directory structure for our application folder. Uh, the main application is defined in this Python file. Uh, we're not gonna spend too much time going over the details of this file. This uses the Flask library for building a web application. Uh, but we're gonna start by defining just a simple Python list, which contains our books that we're going to use to initially populate our database. We create our client instance to access our Mongo database and insert those books into a database called books in a collection called favorites. Then for our main URL, so this is just the root URL for our web app, we're gonna define the get favorites function, and that's going to retrieve that list of favorites from our database, and then use those to populate a template. Let's look quickly at that template definition. So this is a very simple template, it's an HTML file, uh, but this does have Jinja 2 templating embedded in it. That's what the Flask library uses by default. So this is just going to loop through each of our books and add a list item that shows the title, first name, and last name for each of those books. So that's pretty much the entirety of our application. We also have a requirements file, as we've used in past examples. This contains the list of Python libraries that are going to be required by our application. We have a Docker file, which defines the actual application um, image. So we're using the standard MongoDB image from Docker Hub. So we don't need to write a Docker file for that. It's already defined. For our own application, however, we are going to use a Docker file. 
So let's quickly review what we're doing here. So we're going to start with the base Python image using the Alpine operating system. It's a minimal Linux distribution. We're going to define a volume. So this not only defines that folder as part of the container, it will allow us to later map host directories to that folder. We're going to set our working directory to be the app folder, which contains our application. We're going to use APK, which is the Alpine package manager, to install our dependencies. We'll then copy our requirements file over and use pip to install those requirements. We'll then copy our actual application, which is just a single Python file in this case, over to the container in the app directory. For entry point, remember this is the process or the executable that we're going to be running in this container, which is just Python. Then we'll use the command directive to pass in the name of our script, so app.py. So we have two components here. We have our Mongo container, which we're going to use a base image for. Then we have our custom application container, which we're going to build from this Docker file. We then need to build our stack to combine all this together. So this is what a Docker compose file looks like. You should notice this is a YAML file. The first key we need to define in here is the version. In this case, we're going to be using version 2.0. This defines what parameters are acceptable in here, what capabilities Docker Compose can use for this application. Then the first major component of our Compose stack is the services definition. So each entry under services, in this case we have two, Mongo and Web, defines a container as part of our stack. So this defines a two-tier uh, stack with Mongo and web containers. In addition to services, our next top-level declaration is our networks. This is technically optional. Uh, if we wanted to, we could allow Docker Compose to utilize only existing networks, even just placing all these containers in the default network. Optionally, as we're doing here, we can actually create our own networks. So we're going to define a network called backend using the bridge driver and a network called public that also uses the bridge driver. Now let's look in a little bit more detail at each of our service definitions. So for Mongo, we're going to use an image. So this is the name of the image. It's going to look in the local cache first and then in the Docker Hub repository for this image. We'll set the restart policy. This just defines what we do if that image uh, crashes. In this case, we'll just automatically restart it. And then we can define our network attachments. So this is going to have one interface connected to the backend network. So very simple container definition. For web, in this case, rather than using an existing image, we're going to use the build directive to run a Docker build. This will be just like running the Docker build command from the CLI and specify the directory, which will be the same directory as the compose file, as you can see reflected in our uh, directory structure here. The Docker file is at the same level as Docker compose. We can also do volume mapping. So volume mapping allows us to map one or more host directories to volumes on the container. Remember, in our Docker file definition, we defined a volume called templates. In this case, we're going to define and map the local templates folder, which contains our index.html file, to the templates folder path on the container. So that will allow us, once this container is up and running, to actually modify that template on our host system and have that reflected in the container. So this can make testing simpler. Uh, we're going to find our restart policy. We can also pass in environment variables here. So this is a very common paradigm when we're working with Docker in general and Docker Compose specifically. So this environment variable is going to be used inside of our application. In this case, we're going to set a template directory variable to specify where the application should look for its templates. If we go look at our application, you can see we import that at the very top, grab the value for that template directory variable, and use that to set the template folder when we define our Flask uh, application. That's going to tell it where to look for its templates. Then we'll define our port mappings. So we can have multiple port mappings here. In this case, we're going to map host port 8080 to port 5000, which is the port that this container is going to listen on. For our networks, we actually have two network connections for this container. It's going to be connected to our back end. That will allow it to access the database tier and public, which is where the mapping will take place. So this is how uh, we'll actually be able to access this web app once it's up and running. So those are all the components of our application. The beautiful thing here 
is that it takes just a single command to bring up this entire stack. So if we log into our device, verify that we have all those files in place, we can run docker compose up, and we're gonna specify the detached option so that this runs in the background. So we'll run docker compose up. So you can see it's creating our networks. It's also going to create our uh, application images. Now, if this is the first time we'd run Docker Compose up, it would also build that image. In this case, it's using the cache version. And just to show you what that looks like, we can include the build option, which will rebuild that image, even if it doesn't detect any difference between the current version of our web image in our cache and the version defined in our Docker file. So this output, if you've worked with Docker files before, should look very familiar. So we're building out an image based on a Docker file, and then we're spinning up our stack. Now, if we go take a look at the output from Docker container list, you can see what this has done is just spin up two different Docker containers. Uh, the names here, in this case, the name of our web image was generated automatically because we did not specify a name inside of our stack definition. It's running our app. And then we also have our MongoDB running in the background. Now that this is up and running, we can verify that this is reachable by opening a web browser, pointing it at our host IP, which is this IP right here, and then port 80, which is the port we set up uh, NAT for. You can see this displays just a list of all of the books in our database. Now we can go ahead and expand on this in a couple of different ways. First off, let's look at the benefit of using that host volume mapping instead of statically pushing that file and permanently making it part of the container image. So let's say I want to change my formatting here. Maybe instead of having the title and the author's name on the same line, I want them each on their own line. So I don't have to rebuild my image to do that. I can just modify that template file. So if we go into templates, and then index.html is my template file, I can just go in here and change the format. So let's go ahead and put the author name on its own line. like so. So now that we've updated the template, we can reload the page and you'll see the display format has been changed. None of this required us to rebuild the container because the container is accessing a template file, which is also mapped to our local host directory. So modifying that file on the host reflects the changed file on the container. Having a tool like Docker Compose also makes it easy to test application updates. So currently we have this application running, working great. Uh, but we want to add a new function. Right now, this is incredibly static. It just shows us the four values that are inserted automatically into our database. We want to add a new function, a function that actually allows us to add a new book. So we can go ahead and do that by first modifying the source code for our application. And the functionality is actually already in here. It's just commented out. So we'll go ahead and uncomment that. So this adds a new route at the path add that accepts a post method. That post contains JSON data defining a new book. So we'll go ahead and save that. Now, in this case, because the Python script, the file that defines our application is actually part of the container, we are going to have to actually re rebuild the container. However, this is very easy to do since everything is already packaged up as a stack. So we'll use Docker Compose down to bring this down. Going to go ahead and tear down our existing containers. Now we can go ahead and run Docker Compose again. Just bring them right back up. Specify build. This should happen automatically. We're going to make it explicit. So go ahead and rebuild our images based on the new version of our application. Do a Docker container list to verify it is now running again. Let's test that our existing functionality has not been disrupted by reloading the web page. So, so far, so good. So now we want to test the ability to actually add a new entry by sending a post request defining a new book to the add path and verify that it's actually going to be added. So we can do that just using curl. So we're going to use curl to initiate a post request. Here you have the JSON content that defines a new book. So we're going to add Herman Hesse's Siddhartha here. 
In the header argument, we're going to specify the content type is JSON. And then the X argument here, we can specify the method. This is going to be a post method to our same endpoint, but at the add URL path. So you can see printed out success here. So should be working. We can go ahead and return to our web page now and reload it. And we can see that new book has been successfully added. Thank you for joining me today for this Juniper Networks Learning Byte. I hope you found this useful. If you want to see more of these, please subscribe to our channel, and I'll see you for the next one. Visit the Juniper Education Services website to learn more about courses. View our full range of classroom, online, and e-learning courses. Learning paths, industry segment and technology-specific training paths. Juniper Networks Certification Program, the ultimate demonstration of your competence. And the training community. From forums to social media, join the discussion.